Hi everyone, very good evening to everybody. Um, if you have not seen me on any of these videos before, I'm Shweta. I have, uh, I was working with 2IM for about two years and then last year I wrote the GMAT, scored a 780 in it. Um, and then I'm now in the US. I'm going to the USC uh, Marshall School of Business. I'm doing my MBA here in uh, Los Angeles in California. Um, so it's a very pleasant morning for me here. We had a heat wave last week, but then it's been very cool and pleasant today. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a nice weather today. Um, so that's my background. That's just to say hi to you. Um, welcome to the live session. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, reading comprehension passages today. Um, we're going to be looking at CAT 2017, both slot one and slot two passages. And these are going to be um, shorter passages. Um, we did do a session last week and we looked at uh, about three long passages. We're going to be looking at about four uh, shorter passages today from both slot one and slot two. Uh, right, I'm just looking at the confirmation that you are able to hear and see me. Perfect. Um, we'll get started with the passages. Now, if you notice on the uh, screen just before I started talking, we are offering online classes, live sessions. So that is something that you can definitely sign up for. Um, with COVID and everything, and you're not able to go to a classroom environment, you have access to the pre-recorded lessons in the online course. You have live sessions, and you know Rajesh does most of the classes, and then you have um, also access to our printed study material. So it's a fantastic course. I would definitely check out the description uh, for the details, and you can get started on your preparation. Your course would be done by October, well in time for your CAT this year. All right, let's do these passages. Let's get started. The first passage, it's about evolution. All right, let's check this out. Scientists have long recognized the incredible diversity within a species. Okay, so we're talking about diversity, not across species, but within a species. Just get my pen working here. All right, um, but then they thought, but they thought, uh, it reflected evolutionary changes that unfolded imperceptibly. Imperceptibly is not noticeably. Again, very minute changes that happen over a point over a period of time. Right? That's imperceptibly. Now here's a clue that you can pick from the passage. If I said, I used to think the cat was easy, right? I'm saying I used to think the cat was easy in the past tense, which means I don't think it anymore, which means now I think that the cat is not easy, that it is probably difficult. As a parallel example, the point I'm trying to make here is, this sentence says, they thought it reflected evolutionary changes that happen. So the reason for diversity, they thought initially that the diversity was because of the diversity was because of evolutionary changes taught in the past tense, which means they don't think it anymore. And that gives you a good hint of what the passage is going to be about. Because that already tells you that there are two theories, an old theory and possibly a new theory. It's not just evolutionary changes or it's not evolutionary changes. Something like that is going to happen in this passage. And when the passage is only one to three paragraphs long, and you already have an indication that there are like two possible sides to an issue that we're talking about, an old theory versus a new theory. It is unlikely that there is going to be anything else happening in the passage. When a passage is five or six paragraphs long, which is unlikely that you would see such a long passage, there are lots of directional changes that can happen within the passage. Each paragraph can be a small shift in the topic. But with just two or three paragraphs, Sometimes passages such as one paragraph, there aren't too many shifts that can happen. And you already know that there are two sides talked about. So when you read something like this, look for such hints when you're reading the passage. That will give you a really strong indication of what's happening. If you already have a good guess about what's happening in the passage, when you're actually reading it, processing the information and learning from it and understanding it and then answering your questions becomes a lot easier. So this is something that you can practice when you are working on RC right now, not just in the test. So look for such hints on where the direction is and what the author is going to say next. I'm going to go ahead and continue reading. That divergence between populations within a species was enforced according to Ernst Mayer. So we introduced to a guy called Ernst Mayer. Let's call him EM in our notes. The great evolutionary biologist of the 1940s. 
when a population was separated from the rest of the species by a mountain range or a desert okay so evolutionary changes happened or diversity happened when there was a physical separation like with a mountain range or a desert preventing breeding across the divide over geological scales of time sometimes this is another um, tip for you when it's a long sentence or there is a methodology or a process or a scientific theory that is explained um it works for me personally if i can give a quick example to myself right um so there was a himalaya separated uh, animals into india and china and they became two different species so something if you can think of quickly don't waste time trying to think of an example so there's a physical divide and because of that physical divide this population had divergences without the separation gene flow was relentless so when there is separation then there is diversity when there is no separation then there is g- relentless gene flow which means gene flow continues to happen which means the species continues to kind of be the same but as the separation persisted the isolated population grew apart and speciation occurred speciation is basically the creation of a species but you don't have to know that because that's kind of explained in the paragraph in the mid 1960s the biologist paul ulrich so now you're introduced to another guy so possibly notice that he was popular in the 1940s and now you're talking about the 1960s so that clearly supports our idea of an old theory versus a new theory so now you're talking about the theory change right so this guy who's a new theory guy is paul ulrich author of the population bomb and his stanford university colleague peter raven so you have two guys right let's just call them e and r right they challenge mayer's ideas about speciation so they had a different theory they had studied checker spot butterflies living in the jasper ridge biological preserve in california and it soon became clear that they were not examining a single population now the interesting theory is thing is they are looking at one area right just within the biological preserve and they are saying it was not a single population which is probably why they are challenging it because here you need physical separation across multiple places through years of capturing marking and then recapturing the butterflies they were able to prove that within the population spread over just 50 acres of suitable checker spot habitat there were three groups that rarely interacted despite their close proximity so no need for separation it seems to be the uh, point that these guys are making whereas uh, mayer's theory was that you need separation let's continue reading the passage among other ideas elick and raven so enr again we're continuing to talk about them argued in a now classic paper from 1969 that gene flow was not as predictable and ubiquitous as mayer and his cohort maintain if you go back to what we talked about gene flow when there is no separation uh, then gene flow continues to happen always happen right the the words that he used was that gene flow was relentless right it continues to happen that's mayer's theory now he's saying it's not as ubiquitous ubiquitous is like present everywhere so it's not that common as what they are saying right it's not as predictable it doesn't always happen so he's talking about gene flow and thus evolutionary divergence between neighboring groups in a population was probably common they also asserted that isolation and gene flow were less important so isolation was less important to evolutionary divergence than natural selection so now we know their theory and their theory is it's because of natural selection and it's giving you what those factors are what does natural selection comes to when factors such as mate choice weather disease or predation cause better adapted individuals to survive and pass on their successful genetic traits so the first theory mayer's theory is physical separation and uh, early can raven's theory is natural selection is more important right they're not saying natural selection is the only factor which is something you need to pay attention to they are basically saying that isolation and gene flow were less important that's the words that they have used which means Means they are not questioning whether they are a factor. They are questioning it's not the central factor. For example, early and Raven suggested that without the force of natural selection, an isolated population would remain unchanged, and that in other scenarios, natural selection could be strong enough to overpower gene flow. 
just kind of like re-establishing their point. So now we know what's happening in the passage. We're talking about the evolution of a species and there are two sides here. The old theory uh, posited by Mayer is that physical separation is the best way to, is probably the reason for diversification and evolution in a species. And then the second group of guys are saying that more than physical separation and gene flow, it is about natural selection. All right, let's look at the questions. Which of the following best sums up Ehrlich and Raven's argument in their classic 1969 paper? Now, if you notice in the passage, we talked about Ehrlich and Raven in two paragraphs. In the second one and the third one. In the second one, we talked about this butterfly experiment. And then in the third one, which starts off by saying, Ehrlich and Raven argued in a now classic paper from 1969. So this passage, this question references the third paragraph in the passage, which means if you have an option that is exclusive to the second paragraph, that may not necessarily be the answer. Let's look at our options and then do the process of elimination. Ernst Mayer was wrong in identifying physical separation as the cause for species diversity. Now we talked about how they are saying that physical separation was less important. So they never said that Mayer was wrong in saying this was the cause. They're saying Mayer was wrong in saying this was the sole or the predominant cause. So um, they're not questioning whether or not physical separation is the cause. They are accepting that it is the cause. So this would not be the right answer. Checker spot butterflies in the 50 acre Jasper Ridge Preserve formed three groups that rarely interacted with each other. Is absolutely true. Did they talk about it in the paper though? No, it was part of the background for these two guys given in the second paragraph. So I'll hold on to the answer option. Um, it is unlikely to be the right answer. While a factor, isolation was not as important to speciation as natural selection. Now notice the difference between uh, A and C. In A, you're saying isolation is not a factor. In C, you're saying isolation was not as important as natural selection, which means natural selection is more important than isolation, which is the point that these two guys are trying to make. So we'll hold on to C. Definitely seems to be an option that works. Gene flow is less common and more erratic than Mayer and his cl uh, colleagues claim. Are they saying that gene flow is less common Yes, because they're saying it's not ubiquitous. Are they saying it is erratic? Erratic would suggest that it's random, that it's haphazard. You never know when gene flow is going to happen and when it's not going to happen, which is not the point that these two guys are saying. In fact, they're saying that it is affected by factors and there are reasons for it to happen, except that the factor is not separation, the factor is natural selection. So while they're saying one, one part of the option is true, gene flow is less common, they are not saying that gene flow is more erratic. So D does not make sense to me, I'm gonna eliminate it. B is true, but not from the part of the passage that the question is referencing, which means the only option that you're pretty much left with is C. And that would be the right answer for the question. Moving on to question two. All of the following statements are true according to the passage, except. So we talked about except questions in the last week's session as well. Um, don't go in looking for one answer option that is false. Find three options that are true and eliminate them. Then whatever that you're left with would be the right answer. So that's the better way of doing rather than going in and looking for a particular option. Gene flow contributes to evolutionary divergence. Are we saying that gene flow contributes to evolutionary divergence? Yes. We are only saying it's not the primary factor. So we are accepting this. It is stated in the passage. So it is true which means we can go ahead and eliminate it. The population bomb questioned dominant ideas about species diversity. Now it suggests that you go back and look at the passage at where the population bomb is mentioned. Population bomb is mentioned in the second paragraph first sentence when introducing Paul Ulrich. It says in the mid 1960s, the biologist Paul Ulrich, author of the population bomb and his Stanford University colleague, what was the population bomb about? We do not know. We only know that it was written by Paul. And it's not the name of the 1969 paper that we are discussing because the population bomb year in the bracket is 1968. So it's not the classic paper that they're talking about in the third paragraph. So what is this population bomb about? I have no idea. I only know that Paul wrote it. So I'm going to hold on to B. Um, there's no mention in the passage whether it questioned or didn't question, so we'll see. 
evolutionary changes unf- unfold imperceptibly over time that's the introduction to the whole passage that it happens imperceptibly absolutely true Checkerspot butterflies are known to exhibit speciation while living in close proximity. Speciation, as we talked, is the formation of a different species or creation of that diversity. And the whole point of the second para was to show that there were three different variations of the checkerspot butterflies within close proximity. So they exhibit speciation. That is also definitely true, which means the only possible answer here is B, mainly because the passage does not discuss population bomb at all. So we do not know what it did. Did Paul question dominant ideas about species diversity? Yes, the author did. Did he do it in this paper? We have no clue. That's not given in the passage. So these are the things that you have to be careful about when reading your answer options. It is very easy for you to say Paul Ulrich is questioning dominant ideas about species diversity and associate it to this paper. But he need not have done it in this work. He could have done it in other works. And that is something you have to be super careful about. The last question on the passage, we'll discuss this and then I'll have a quick look at the chat and then see if you guys have asked any questions there. The author discusses Mayer, Ulrich and Draven to demonstrate that. Now notice that he's mentioning all three of them, right? Um, it is not just one side or two sides. Overall, it's about the discussion, right? So the answer option has to be something generic, something broad that talks about speciation in general and not necessarily about one point of view. It should not be specific to either natural selection or physical separation. Evolution is a sensitive and controversial topic. We are not talking about whether Kim Kardashian should have worn something or not for it to be a controversial or a sensitive topic. It's just a scientific debate that's happening. So be careful about the choice of words. Yes, are they debating it? Yes. Does that mean it's controversial uh, and sensitive? Not necessarily. So be very careful about these words. Ehrlich and Raven's ideas about evolutionary divergence are widely accepted by scientists. Which one is more acceptable than the other one? We have not talked about it. We've only said the first guy, Mayer, came up with this theory and then in the 1960s, these guys questioned it. Um, is now a third theory, has a, now, has a third theory now come up that people are widely accepting that has disproven all of these theories? We have no idea. So this is acceptance by scientists, right? That has not been discussed anywhere in the passage. The causes of speciation are debated by scientists. Yes, clearly, these guys are arguing about it. Checkerspot butterflies offer the best example of Ulrich and Raven's ideation. It's just something that they did not necessarily the best example. So be careful about the use of such superlatives as well. Just because a guy is doing something or saying something is good, doesn't mean he's saying it's awesome and best. So be careful about that, which means the best option that would work here is cause of speciation are debated by scientists. As I said, very broad, very generic answer option, which is typical in such questions because the question talks about all of the authors mentioned here. So it has to be a common thread to everyone. And when you are asking for a common thread in a debated topic, then saying they're debating or saying they're talking about evolution is pretty much the only thing that you can say here. All right, let's look at the chat. I am seeing a bunch of highs and hellos. So I'm going to assume that you're okay with passage one. And we're going to move on. To passage number two. All right. Passage is about Olympic cities. Like the Olympic Games. Too bad the latest one was cancelled because of COVID. Right? All right, let's get started. Do sports mega events like the Summer Olympic Games benefit the host city economically? All right, that clearly establishes the topic. We're talking about the Olympic Games. We're talking about how it affects the host city economically. So we're not talking about. Um, other non-economic effects, right? It, uh, it comes, it boils down to the dollars, right? And the answer is right there. It depends, but the prospects are less than rosy, which means the author is going to, they're not great is what he's saying, which means the author is going to explain why it's not that great f- uh, uh, an economic benefit to the host city um, when, when they conduct the Summer Olympic Games. All right, the trick, 
uh, the important thing therefore his suggestion is converting several billion dollars in operating costs during the 17 day fiesta of the games into a basis for long term economic returns so if they have to derive value from the host, uh, olympic games economically then they have to convert it into long term economic returns these days the olympic games themselves generate a total revenue of 4 to 5 billion dollars so you get a lot of money from the olympic games during those 17 days but the lion's share of this goes to the international olympics committee the national olympic committee and the international sports federation so all of these guys are taking the money away from the city during those 17 days any economic benefit would have to flow from the value of the games as an advertisement for the city so this is one option the new transportation and communication infrastructure so the infrastructure is the second possibility or the ongoing use of the new facilities so the facilities is your third possibility so this is saying that any economic benefit so he's not saying that this will definitely benefit if at all you get any benefit it has to come from the advertisement the infrastructure and the facilities not from the 17 days all right so we're probably going to talk about these three right because the first sentence of the next para says evidence suggests that the advertising effect is far from certain so it's ruling that out advertising effect is not working you're not going to get a lot from it the infrastructure benefit depends on the initial condition of the city and the effectiveness of the planning so again there are problems there right if your city was not great to begin with and if your planning is not bad then you don't get the infrastructure benefit the facilities benefit is dubious at best so he's question all three and is pointing out that none of the three are certain for buildings such as velodromes and natatoriums what are velodromes and natatoriums do you know what they are don't worry about it let's finish reading the sentence and problematic for 100,000 seat olympic stadiums so he's saying that the possibility of getting facilities benefits is dubious or doubtful for buildings such as velodromes if you don't know what velodromes are don't panic because the whole point could be that you don't know it right you don't even know what this facility is how are you going to use it and problematic for 100,000 seat olympic stadiums he's talking clearly about the size of the stadium the latter which is the 100,000 seat olympic stadium requires a conversion plan for future use how we're going to use it later the former are usually doomed to nearly vacancy and by former he is referring to our velodromes right so they don't run your vacancy because if people don't know what they are and if it's not a popular sport then why would they be using it hosting the summer games generally requires 30 plus sports venues you're gonna have 30 such venues and dozens of training centers today the bird's nest in beijing sits virtually empty while the olympic stadium in sydney costs some 30 million dollars a year to operate so clearly he's trying to show that either the sports are not popular and no one goes to the facilities afterwards so um so there is they're not popular right or they are huge and cost a lot like the olympic stadium in sydney those seems to be the central theme around facilities that he's talking about in this passage in this paragraph all right let's move on part of the problem is that olympics planning takes place in a frenzied and time pressured atmosphere of intense competition um, with other prospective host cities frenzied is like in a hurry you're rushing around you, you're not doing a your due diligence you're not sitting and thinking things are you're just doing everything haphazard right not optimal conditions for contemplating the future shape of an urban landscape so this is not ideal you're competing with another guy this uh, you you like Beijing is thinking Sydney is going to put in an application and uh, I have to outperform them I have to show better than them so what things can we add and then I'm trying to do it in a time frame right so it's not an ideal condition another part of the problem is that urban land is generally scarce and growing scarcer so land is obviously a shortage that we know in everywhere the new facilities often stand for decades or longer even if they have future use which is doubtful if they have a future use even if they do that are they the best use of precious urban real estate so you have so many things that you can build in a city and space in a city is so scarce do you really want to invest that in an olympic stadium further cities must consider the human costs residential areas are often raised and citizens are relocated without adequate preparation or compensation yes life is made more hectic and congested because of all the extra people there or whatever right just the construction and everything right 
there are after all other productive uses that can be made of vanishing fiscal resources so your money can be put to better uses but you have to consider the human cost so the whole point of the last couple of paragraphs is to point out the reasons uh, that they don't work right reasons for i'm just going to say failure but basically reasons that you know the host cities are not able to get money out of the olympic stadiums and a lot of it has to do with the urban landscape and the people living in there all right so um if i was looking at this passage in terms of a test environment it's an easy to read passage it's not difficult to understand especially because it's on a topic that is relatable we all know about the olympic games we can all understand the reality of city planning and how it causes congestion and relocation and all of that no one thing i would probably do is just based on the fact that this is four paragraphs long <clears throat> and is followed by three questions in terms of time management i would put it on the back burner just by looking at the passage and then revisit it later there are several reasons for you to choose to do a passage or not do a passage when we are discussing a passage and looking at the difficulty of the questions it is very easy to retrospectively say this is not a passage that i would do in a cat environment which is valid which is important for you to know but um as a student how do you figure out whether you are working whether a passage is something that you should do in the moment one is the length of the passage versus kind of like a cost benefit analysis how much time am i spending on the passage to read and understand it versus how many questions can i get out of it that's one factor another factor is you should be able to determine how well you are going to be able to read the passage based on the first few sentences of the passage and that takes a lot of practice to get there you need to practice rc diligently because if you're not an a regular reader if you're not practicing reading comprehension every passage will feel difficult and if every passage feels difficult then you're not going to be able to decide after reading the first few sentences whether you're looking at an easy to read or a difficult to read passage right so that's a factor practice enough so that after reading the first few sentences of a passage you're able to decide the language or the point that the author is trying to make in the passage none of this is difficult for me to process i can go ahead and read this passage comfortably because usually the tone and the language stays the same consistently across the passage so if you can figure out based on the first paragraph you should be able to determine the rest and then the third point of difficulty that could arise is in the questions themselves the questions could be hard even though the passage was easy to read and that is when you have to take the call to do the questions selectively you read a question you look through the options you set yourself a time limit and then you're saying then okay i've invested this amount of time i cannot make head or tails out of this question you should be willing to take the call to skip the question and move on or on reading the question you're not sure which part of the passage it references to if you move on you finish reading the passage and you realize i kind of get what he's saying in parts of it but i don't get the overall theme then you skip questions such as main idea and central theme and questions like that so there are three different levels in which you can take a call on whether to do the passage now do it later or simply skip it and that is when you're looking at the length of the passage versus the questions when you start reading the passage and you're determining the difficulty of the reading and the processing of the information and then when you're looking at the questions and then you're looking at uh, how difficult the question is i don't find this passage difficult to read but in a test environment for this length i would probably say i'm going to do it later i won't skip the passage but i'll say i'll do it later simply because it's four paragraphs for three questions all right let's look at the questions the central point in the first paragraph is that economic benefits of the olympic games first paragraph is basically saying cities don't get economic benefits they make 4 to 5 billion dollars in 17 days but then the lion's share goes to the committees if at all cities get any benefits it has to come from those three factors advertisement infrastructure and later use of facilities all right now let's look at our answer options are shared equally among the three organizing committees where well, the organizing committees get the money but are they shared equally there's no mention of equally in the passage so i'm going to eliminate that accrue mostly through revenue from advertisements and ticket sales he is saying that you get economic benefits for the city from the advertisement value to the city 
It doesn't mention ticket sales anywhere in the passage. And the question is about economic benefits to the Olympic Games. This option doesn't talk specifically about city or who is getting these benefits. So I'm going to eliminate this option as well. Accrue to host cities, if at all, only in the long term. Okay, that makes sense. If at all they get revenue, it happens in the long term and the, from the later use of the infrastructure and the um, facilities, right? So we'll hold on to this option. Are usually eroded by expenditure. We've not talked about expenditure incurred by the host city, not in the first paragraph. In the tail end of the passage, in the last sentence, he's saying, if you're going to be spending money, why not spend it on other reasons? But in the first paragraph, which is what the question is talking about, there is no mention of expenditure. And we're going to go ahead and eliminate D as well. And that pretty much leaves us with, leaves us with C as the answer. If at all they get any benefits, it's only in the long term from those three factors. That's mentioned in the first paragraph. Sports facilities built for the Olympics are not fully utilized after the games are over because... All right, we're talking about facilities... And you remember facilities was the core discussion aspect in the second paragraph after they ruled out infrastructure and advertising in the first one, two sentences. Um, and there were, we identified two reasons and we put it down in the notes. One of them is that they are not popular and people do not know um, what velodromes are and whatever, so they are not uh, used frequently. Right, the doomed for near vacancy is what the passage says. And then the second factor that we talked about was that they're huge and then they cost a lot, um, which was the, the $30 million example given for the Olympic Stadium in Sydney. Right? All right, let's look at your options. The scale and cost of operating them are large. Yes, that's the Sydney example. That is a reason that is given. So we'll hold on to this. The location away from the city center usually limits easy access. We have not talked about the location or about the accessibility. It's popularity, cost. Those are the two factors. So I'm going to rule this out. The authorities do not adapt them to local conditions. We have not talked about adapting them. They become outdated, having been built with a little planning and under time pressure. Um, they have mentioned that they are built with little planning and, and, and under time pressure. This part of it is mentioned in the third paragraph. But is it outdated? That's not necessarily something that he is saying. The outdated part is questionable. Right? So that's why I'm going to rule out D, which means your answer is A. The scale and cost of operating them are large, which is the point that we're trying to make in the second paragraph um, when, quoting, uh, when quoting the Sydney example and the Beijing examples. Moving on to the third question. The author feels that the games place a burden on the host city for all of the following reasons except that. So, uh, burden on the host city, we talked about all of this in the third and the fourth paragraphs. If you remember, we talked about the human cost, we talked about um, the time pressure, the lack of space and how urban land is generally scarce and growing scarcer. I'm looking down because I have the passage printed for me. Right? Um, and then it talks about residential areas being raised and citizens relocated. Those are the sentences in the last paragraph and then a couple of sentences towards the end of the third paragraph. That's where you should be looking at for the answers. Again, it's an accept question. Find three that are true and eliminate them. Whatever you're left with is the answer. Right? They divert scarce urban land from more productive uses. Absolutely mentioned in the passage, they're talking about scarcity. They involve the demolition of residential structures to accommodate sports facilities and infrastructure. Yes, that's in the fourth paragraph. Um, the finances used to fund the games could be better used for other purposes. This is in the last sentence of the passage. When he says there are, after all, other productive uses that can be made of vanishing fiscal resources. Um, so that's the last sentence of the passage. So all of these three are definitely true. The influx of visitors during the games places a huge strain on the urban infrastructure. We have not talked about visitors in the last paragraph. In fact, we have not talked about visitors anywhere in the passage other than to mention that you could use advertising to attract visitors. But whether that works, whether the visitors come, etc., etc., has not been discussed anywhere in the passage, which means your answer has to be D. All right. Let's take a minute again. See if uh, there are any questions that I can answer for you on the chat.
There was a question about the third um, question on the first passage, but I'm seeing that it has already been answered in the chat. This is a very generic question. Um, when confused between two options, how to identify the right one, ma'am? Um, I wish I could give you a one sentence answer to that. It depends on why you are confused and what kind of a question you're looking at. I can give you just a couple of quick tips. If you're confused about a broad generic question, such as what's the central theme of the first para, what's the central theme of the overall passage, what's the main idea of the passage, what's the author's purpose in the passage, those kind of questions, um, then ask yourself, does the author have an opinion to express in the passage or is the passage factual? If the passage is factual, the right answer is most often than not something that summarizes the whole discussion for you. So ask yourself which option does the best summary. If the author has an opinion to express in the passage, ask yourself which option better captures the author's opinion in the passage. That's a good way to do it. If it is a specific question that points to, uh, like the question that you still see on the screen, why do the games place a burden on the host city? It's referencing a particular part of the passage. So the best way to do these questions would be cross-reference with the information given in the passage. Um, you want to make sure that you're not making any assumptions or extrapolating from the information given. The good best uh, example that I gave earlier for an earlier question is one, one potential way to do it. Or even in the first passage when he said that Physical separation is not the reason, and then you had options, uh, sorry, it's not the primary reason, and then you had options saying physical separation is not at all a reason. So that's extending from what the passage is discussing. Author of the passage has only said that these guys think it's not the primary reason or the main reason. You can't say it's not a reason at all. So going beyond uh, the scope is basically um, what you have to avoid in those questions. These are just examples of common mistakes that people make um, it depends on the question. It depends on why you're making mistakes more than anything else. Because some people have trouble with reading and comprehending information. Some people have a problem because they are not reading an answer option completely. Some people have an answer uh, problem because they go in with pre-set ideas. This has to be the option. And then they just blindly pick it. They don't even look at the other options and try to see whether they are right or wrong. So there are several personal factors that you have to do that uh, self-reflection, see why you're making the mistakes and see why you're not able to choose. That's really a high overview. Um, there's a statement about how it's better to choose the passage if you already have some idea about the topic. There is a caveat to that. If you already have an idea about the topic, then a problem is that that preset notion that I was just talking about can come in because of your pre-existing ideas, then uh, you would start uh, imposing that information onto the questions. Stuff that is not at all there in the passage. Remember that uh, you should only use familiarity with the topic to the extent of saying, this is going to be easy for me to read. You should not bring understanding of a topic into the reading comprehension because it is about only about the scopes of the passage, right? And you have to stay within those limits. If you are um, having trouble understanding the passage, um, when you're reading the paragraph, as someone has mentioned, then I would say break it down sentence by sentence. If necessary, even parts of a sentence at a time. Don't try and process after you finish reading the process. Uh, after you finish reading the paragraph, process as you go. Stop every sentence and ask yourself, what have we talked about so far? Now, specific to this passage, we'll look at this as the last question and then we'll go to passage three. Um, so how is the fourth option wrong in question three, which is a question that you see on the screen. If you look at the uh, last paragraph, I'm reading the last paragraph. Cities must consider the human cost. Residential areas often are raised and citizens are relocated. We're talking about citizens. We have not talked about visitors so far. Without adequate preparation or compensation. Life is made more hectic and congested. Now you're extrapolating that by congested you mean visitors. As I said when we were discussing the passage, 
uh, it could mean visitors it could mean just the construction process of it it could mean that it's just the fact that there are extra buildings there so why does it become hectic and congested is it because of the visitors passage does not say that and that's the kind of extrapolation that i was talking about that you have to avoid stick to the borders or the boundaries of the passage stay within what the passage is saying don't interpret it in your head based on real life information and extend beyond that that's that's what i would say and that is why the fourth option is wrong we know that cities become congested we don't know that it's because of the visitors it could simply be because there is construction or other buildings happening i am going to move on to the next passage Let's look at passage number three. Keep an eye on the channel stuff. Hey, right, these two passages are from slot two. Typewriters. Wow. Been a while since we even used a typewriter. I don't know if anyone has used a typewriter. I used to have one at home because my father was a businessman who sometimes worked from home, and we had this old typewriter, and. I don't know the last I saw it was when I was 10 or 12 years old. All right. Unnecessary information, well, let's go ahead and read the passage. Typewriters are the epitome of a technology or the like epitome is the like the peak or the perfect representation of a technology that has been completely rendered obsolete. So it is the peak or the perfect example of something that is obsolete or useless in the digital age, right? The ink comes off the ribbon they weigh a ton and second thoughts are a disaster what does he mean by second thoughts are a disaster basically you don't have the backspace key to go back and change text like you have in word um so if you start typing something and then you change your mind about what to say then going back and making those changes and striking things out and then retyping it is a problem right so is describing why typewriters don't work or the problems basically but they are also personal portable and above all private so this is kind of like an advantage that he is not talking about above all private which means this is something that they are giving most importance to type a document and lock it away and more or less the only way anyone else can get it is if you give it to them because uh, they're talking about hacking here if you type something on your computer you don't have to necessarily be uh, it doesn't have to be secure somebody could hack into your computer and take it away whereas with a typewriter that doesn't happen that is why the russians have decided to go back to typewriters in some government offices so specifically in government offices right and why in the us some departments have never abandoned them so government offices in russia and the us still use typewriters because of that inability to hack which is possible with any digital device yet it is not just their resistance to algorithms and secret surveillance that keeps typewriter production lines Well, one at least, which means some one line of typewriters in manufacturing, in business. The last British one closed a year ago. So it's kind of like a side note here. So privacy is not the main. Uh, his of these three factors of personal, portable, and private, privacy was an important factor. But privacy is not the only factor. Um, nor is it the nostalgic appeal of the metal body. So nostalgic is like thinking back about the past and feeling good about it. Like how I started this passage, telling you a story about my father being a businessman and how I remember seeing him working on a typewriter. Um, that's me being nostalgic, right? Thinking about the past and feeling good about it. So nostalgic is one factor, but it's not only nostalgic. It's not the only factor of the metal body and the stout, well-defined keys that make them popular on eBay. a typewriter demands something particular attentiveness so now that's our third factor privacy is one reason it's popular nostalgia is another reason attentiveness by the time the paper is loaded the ribbon is tightened the carriage returned the spacing and the margins set there is a big premium on hitting the right key um so there's so much pre work that you have to do that you might as well be careful and you there is a value that's placed and you on being careful that means sorting out ideas pulling together a kind of order and organizing details before actually striking off there can be no thinking on screen with the typewriter because you've done so much work to set up the typewriter you're not thinking as you go 
and correcting yourself you're planning everything out you're pulling ideas together and you're organizing the details before you even start typing nor are there any easy distractions so distractions is another factor he's now bringing in so there are no distractions and that's presented as a good thing right no online shopping no urgent emails no twitter no need even for electricity perfect for writing in a remote hideaway so if you wanted to go away somewhere and write that's also perfectly possible when you are using a typewriter the thinking process is accompanied by the encouraging clack of the keys and the ratchet of the car uh, carriage return ping right i like the ping at the end of the passage um so the author is looking at typewriters positively even though he starts off by saying that it's basically a technology that has been made obsolete by the digital age so the whole point of the passage is to explain why typewriters still work he's talking about privacy for garments talking about nostalgia and he's also talking about how big the whole process is such a nice process you spend so much time on it that your thoughts are organized there are no distractions and the, your thought pro thinking process is encouraged right by the sounds and by the whole um, setting up of the typewriter process i feel like the author almost romanticizes typewriters a little bit because of the positive uh, vibe in the passage um it's like looking at it feels like the author is a little bit nostalgic as well just like me when reading this passage let's look at the questions which one of the following best describes what the passage is trying to do and the passage is trying to explain why typewriters still work right which is almost what answer option a pretty much word by word says it describes why people continue to use typewriters even in the digital age so that's exactly what i just said why typewriters still work so i'm going to hold on to a and then we'll look at the other options it argues that typewriters will continue to be used even though they are an ob absolute te obsolete technology okay is he talking about typewriters being used in the present yes is he saying they will continue to be used in the future um there is no mention of the future anywhere in the passage so i would question the validity of this option it highlights the personal benefits of using typewriters does it highlight the benefits of using the typewriter yes does it highlight personal benefits um not entirely right it talks about factors other than personal benefits yes he talks about the thinking process which you could classify as a personal benefit but then um privacy for example in government buildings is not necessarily a um personal benefit right it's just a reason that people use typewriters so i'm questioning c will hold on to it for the moment I highly doubt it's the answer it shows that computers offer fewer options than typewriters it's not a comparison between computers and typewriters explicitly we talk about computers only to show um what benefits you get from typewriters or how typewriters are different rather than fewer or greater number of options it is not about the number of options so i'm going to go ahead and eliminate d so it comes down to a describes why people use typewriters even in the digital age which could be for any reason whatsoever it highlights the personal benefits of using typewriters which is a slightly narrower option because it specifically says personal and that is why we just talked about it before we started this passage and you need to when you're choosing between two options and you're looking at best describes or main idea kind of passage you need to look at what's the scope of the passage and you need to look at which one best summarizes the discussion here and a does more than c because c rules out things like privacy in government buildings and that is why a is the best option i'm glad that we talked about uh there was a question about choosing between two options and we talked about looking for an option that best summarizes the discussion before we did this passage i completely forgot this question was there and then we were going to do it right after but i'm glad we had that discussion because this question can be a prime example of how you make that choice and how you look at the scope how you look at whether it best summarizes the information and then you realize that you have to pay attention to the words in your answer options when you're reading a passage and you don't understand a word or you don't read every word you might still be okay with it but if when you're reading your answer options you need to be way more careful than when you're reading the passage itself according to the passage some governments still use typewriters because specifically about governments it is about 
you know hacking and surveillance and uh, safety and security so you want an option that talks about that they do not want to abandon old technologies that may be useful in the future again we have not talked about the future we are not talking about usefulness so i'm going to eliminate that they want to ensure what that typewriter production lines remain in business there's one production line in business they are not trying to save the business empire so that's out they like the nostalgic appeal that's people who buy it on ebay um that's not necessarily the garment so i'm going to rule it out they can control who reads the document absolutely that's about security and safety and clearly d is your answer we've talked about different reasons for different people for the garment it's all about privacy and safety and security and the only option that even hints at that is d none of the other options even touch on privacy issues now i would say is a super straightforward question we can move on to question number 3 the writer praises typewriters for all of the following reasons except so we talked about um how he's talking about the positive uh, aspects towards the end so it helps you think um it helps you be organized there's a nostalgic appeal to it so we look at four options that say that so an except question so we're looking at three true options and then we'll eliminate them unlike computers they can only be used for typing yes he absolutely says that no online shopping no twitter that stated in the passive so you don't have any distractions and he is seeing that as a good thing you cannot revise what you have typed on a typewriter absolutely because this is the organization part of it and this is the distraction part of it typewriters are noisier than computers it is presented as a positive thing in the last sentence when he says the thinking process is accompanied by the encouraging clack of keys so the sound of the keys is actually encouraging so that's a good thing because it helps the thinking process so they are noisier and the noise helps you think so c is also given in the passage typewriters are messier to use than computers messiness is mentioned in the passage in the second sentence when it says the ink comes off the ribbon that could be potentially a messy thing um, but that is when he was talking about the disadvantages of using the typewriter and why it is now obsolete it is not an advantage and the question is asking you for why the writer praises typewriters and therefore your answer will have to be d so take another quick look at the chat and your questions and then we have one last passage to do All right, I don't see anything specific and most of the questions have been answered. Perfect. So what we are going to do is do the last passage of the day. And the last passage is about Vikings. Oh, I love Vikings. Right. Despite their Okay. So um if you notice something I'm making this comment at the beginning of each passage, right? Typewriters and oh, I feel nostalgic because my dad used to use typewriters. Vikings, I love Vikings. I am not doing that just for the purposes of discussing the passage. I'll tell you how it started. When I wrote the cat, um, and there were topics or passage discussions that I didn't like. Mostly, they were science passages, especially some kind of a or economics passages i hated both of those when i was a cat student and then i'm talking back in 2004 um so when i started reading those passages immediately in my head i used to go oh my god i hate this passage i never understand economics passages um i am going to definitely mess up this passage i'm going to make mistakes and all of that and even if it was a very simple passage just the fear Oh, I messed up economics passages. Made me mess up the passages more. Um, so I started doing this in a way to trick me. And when you do it regularly, it works. I make an association when I start reading the first sentence of the passage that is positive. So I see the passage is about Vikings. I'm like, oh, I like Vikings. I love Thor, right? 
that f- and then that enthusiasm even if it's faked at the beginning kind of carries over you start seeing the passage positively you're motivated to read when you have to read and read and read every day so that you can get a score in the test you start questioning why you're doing it and will i have to read about all of this after i graduate do i need to do about vikings to get an mba we start having all of these negative thoughts so to me this was a trick to motivate me to read more and motivate a positive feeling towards the passage and it became something that i did so regularly that i'm still doing it years later whenever i do an rc passage it is a reflex for me to read a passage and then say something positive about it after reading the first sentence trust me it works especially if you are prone to negativity it has nothing to do with your reading abilities it has nothing to do with your processing abilities it is entirely to do with your psychology when approaching rc it stems a fear if a fear arises in you when you're doing rc to that extent it helps that's why i'm like i start the passage and then i go oh i like this i say that every passage in my head and now when i'm doing these classes sometimes i say it out loud that's just to motivate me to read the passage and it worked for me try it out if you are someone who feels fear for rc do it every single time see if by the time you write the cat it works for you all right all right let's do the passage despite their fierce reputation vikings may not have always been the plunderers and pillagers uh popular culture imagines them to me so they were not always plundering and pillaging pillaging is to like raid a city and then take all the resources and everything from there right in fact they got their start trading so now you know what the passage is going to talk about the popular image is that we think of vikings as this violent people who come and who raid a village and then take everything from it but they actually got their start trading in northern european markets research as such so why and how is this theory come about is what we are going to be discussing in the passage combs carved from animal antlers as well as cob manufacturing waste and raw antler material has turned up as three archaeological sites in denmark including a medieval marketplace in the city of ribe so suddenly we've shifted to talk about combs there has to be some relationship because we are talking about archaeological sites and we are talking about vikings of the past so there is going to be some relationship some tie back to why the vikings were traders so wait for it to happen um don't question too much so we all we know is combs were found in certain places including a medieval marketplace a team of researchers from denmark and the uk hope to identify the species of animal to which the antlers once belonged by analyzing collagen proteins in the samples and comparing them across the animal kingdom so to, they took the collagen proteins collagen proteins are found in the skin and in the connecting tissues and things like that which you didn't need to know they took some protein and then they compared it across the animal kingdom to see which animal species it matched laura gegel reports for life science i would just make a note of laura gegel but it also says that she reported it for life science which means she is not the scientist involved here and therefore it is unlikely that she has an opinion on it and if it's unlikely that she has an opinion on it it is unlikely that there is a question on it so it may not matter for you to know what she is saying she is just reporting information found by some archaeologists sorry some uh, researchers from denmark and the uk Somewhat surprisingly molecular analysis of the artifacts revealed that some combs and other material had been carved from reindeer antlers so they identified it was reindeer and that was surprising why was it surprising given that reindeer don't that's the scientific name for it don't live in denmark so they found this in denmark but there are no reindeer in denmark the scientists posit posit is to suggest or make a theory that it arrived on viking ships from norway so they found the antlers came from reindeer there are no reindeer in denmark which means the antlers and the reindeer came from norway which means it came via the vikings this is the whole point of the discussion here <clears throat> antler craftsmanship in the form of decorative combs was part of viking culture so that's a second reason to believe it one there were no antlers reindeer antlers in uh, denmark second comb manufacturing was a thing in viking culture 
such cones served as symbols of good health gaggle rice the fact that the animals shed their antlers also made them easy to collect from the large herds that inhabited norway so there are large herds of reindeer they naturally shed their antlers so it becomes easier to just collect them and make cones so all of this is supporting why the viking were traders since the artifacts were found in marketplace areas at each side so they were all found in market places it's more likely that the norsemen came to trade rather than pillage so they did bring the combs with them but then all of them were found in market places which means they were trading rather than pillaging most of the artifacts also date to the 780s but some are as old as 725 okay that predates predates is before that is before the beginning of viking raids on great britain by about 70 years so when you thought that the, there is a information there <coughs> Traditionally, the so-called Viking Age began with these raids in 793. We thought initially that the Vikings came only in 793, but some of these artifacts are as old as 725, which means they came before the raids. Archaeologists had suspected that the Vikings had experience with long maritime voyages that might have preceded their raiding days. So there was a theory earlier itself; they might have traveled before the raids. Beyond Norway, these combs would have been a popular industry in Scandinavia as well. It's possible that the antler combs represent a larger trade network where the Norsemen, which is another word for Vikings, supplied raw material to craftsmen in Denmark and elsewhere. So the whole point of this comb discussion is to establish that the Vikings came to um, Europe to trade and not just to pillage. So there is a lot of information that they are giving there in terms of. Uh, the the f- place in which it was found it was found in market places it was found way before the raids started there is existing theory and suspicion that they had had experience with maritime voyages so the whole point of the passage is to say maybe the vikings were traders as well and not just plunderers <clears throat> and let's look at the questions the primary purpose of the passage is just what we talked about maybe the vikings were traders as well they were not just plunderers let's see which of the options best captures that to explain the presence of reindeer antler combs in denmark we are doing that but the point of the passage is not to explain the presence we are using this as support to say that the vikings the first sentence they got their start trading in northern european markets in the first paragraph that's the point that's what we are trying to support here to contradict the widely accepted beginning date for the viking age and propose an alternate one he is not proposing an alternate one he is not saying that the beginning date is wrong for the viking age usually an age is the period of strength so maybe the period of strength was still the 1795 to whatever <coughs> excuse me but their presence was before the viking age that's what we are trying to say <clears throat> to challenge the popular perception of vikings as raiders by using evidence that suggests their early trade relations yes they are not just raiders they had trade relations this is definitely something we are trying to establish in the passage to argue that besides being violent pillagers uh, vikings were also skilled craftsmen and efficient traders skilled craftsmen no one said the combs were awesome and efficient traders no one said they made a lot of money so he is just adding these adjectives here about being skilled and efficient and uh, that's not what we are trying to argue here we are just arguing that they are traders period not efficient traders um which means the best option here would be c <clears throat> the evidence most of the artifacts also date to the 780s but some are as old as 725 has been used in the passage to argue that So when you see a quote from the passage, go and read the surrounding sentences to see why he's saying that. If you go back to the passage, <clears throat> he says most of the artifacts, the sentence, and then the next sentence says that predates the beginning of Viking raids on Great Britain by about seventy years. Archaeologists had suspected that the Vikings had experience with long maritime voyages that might have preceded their raiding days. So the whole point is to say. they came to europe they had experienced voyages even before they started the raids right that's what you're trying to say in the next couple of sentences after bringing up the year so the beginning date of the viking age 
the author of the questions is obsessed with the beginning date of the Viking age. He's not proposing a new one. No one is saying it has to be revised. We're just saying they traveled. The Viking raids started as early as 725. No, they were not raiding in 725. They were trading in 725. So these two options are definitely out. Some of the antler artifacts found in Denmark and Great Britain could have come from Scandinavia. Um, that's not the point of the argument here. It's not to say they could have come from Scandinavia. We have established that it did come from Scandinavia by talking about the fact that it was reindeer antlers and there were no reindeer in Denmark at that point. So it's not, a th um, we're not saying, this. the point is, the date of the, the point of, my tongue. I'm having trouble forming words apparently. All right, the point of mentioning the dates is not to mention where it came from. We're talking about dates to see when what happened. When you say that it was reindeer antlers and then the collagen proteins and all of that, that was to establish that it came from Scandinavia, not the date discussion. Right, I finally got what I wanted to say out. The Viking trade relations with Europe predates the Viking dates. Absolutely, that is so straightforward. They came before they started raiding. That's all that we are trying to establish here. And that is the answer. The simplest answer, that doesn't add any, um, any extra words. That doesn't change the tone of the passage. That is always the right answer. All of the following hold true for Vikings except our last question of the day. Except question, process of elimination, we want three true options. Vikings brought reindeer from Norway to Denmark for trade purposes. Okay, first off, did they trade a reindeer or did they trade antlers and combs made out of antlers? I'm going to hold on to A. I, uh, will, I don't see any reference in the passage that they actually transported reindeers in their ships. Before becoming the raiders of Northern Europe, Vikings had trade relations with European nations. That is the point of the passage, 100% true. Antler combs regarded by the Vikings as a symbol of good health, that is mentioned in the passage, were part of the Viking culture. That is a direct quote almost from the last but one sentence of the first paragraph. So, um, sorry, from the second paragraph, that is absolutely true as well. Vikings once upon a time had trade relations with Denmark and Scandinavia. B and D are the same thing, absolutely true. We know they traded combs that they carved out of antlers. Did they bring the reindeer itself? There is no such mention in the passage and that is why A is your answer. All right, I'm gonna take a minute. See if you have any questions. If not, we're wrapping this up. All right, so there's a question about why we cannot say that the Viking Age or raid started in um, 725. I'll address the raid point. The right point is to attack people and to take their stuff without them giving it up, right? Like that's a raid. Um, and we are trying to establish the whole point of the passage is to say that they were trading in marketplaces. And if they're trading in marketplaces, then you're trying to say that they were traders. They were not raiding. And therefore, you cannot say that the raid started in 725. There is nothing in the passage to indicate that they attacked Denmark in 725. They traded with Denmark in 725. With regard to why Viking age, that kind of stems from what you classify as an age. When um, something is at its best, you call it the age. They traded in 725, but were they at their best in 725? We do not know. That has not been discussed in the passage. For you to classify the Viking Age as starting from a particular point in time, you have to talk about how the Vikings were at their best, how they were awesome, and how they were influencing cultures, whether by force or because of their, um, I don't know, amazingness, <laughs> right? Um, you have to explain why they were at their peak. Then you call it an age. And that is not a discussion in the passage. We have not gone into those details. And that is why revision of the Viking Age beginning date is not within the scope of the passage. You need more information on that. There has to be further proof given to establish that. And I think that's about the questions. Um, I see that the rest are answered in the passage. I hope that whatever information you received was helpful to you. Um,
Good luck with your preparation.